Well, good morning. Thanks for joining us here today. Uh, it's a beautiful day here in the state of Wisconsin. I hope it's a great day wherever you're at. Uh, I uh, look forward to being able to see many of you again in person. It was great to see many of you at uh, ALEC uh, in Phoenix uh, last December, and uh, it's nice to be able to connect virtually here today. Today, you're going to hear uh, in a minute from David and then from uh, Majority Leader Hoffman uh, about the need for a balanced budget amendment. And I remember uh, back in December when I was interacting with many of you at the ALEC conference then, we were talking about the need to address our nation's debt. And we were looking ahead thinking the debt would be uh, fearfully uh, as much as $23 trillion. Today, if you look at the national debt clock, it's over $26.5 trillion. Obviously, a lot's happened since then. And we've seen the trillions of dollars being spent by the federal government, some of which you may uh, contend is legitimate in terms of the Paycheck Protection Program, but much more of it is, is largely unrelated to COVID-19 or any other things related to it. It's just more and more spending. And in fact, um, Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, introduced a bill uh, a month and a half or so ago that was a total of about $3 trillion. Put that in perspective, when she was first elected to office in 1987, uh, that was more than the entire national debt. That's what she's talking about, one bill. Um, we're fast approaching a point of, of crisis. When you're talking $26.5 trillion, and we're on track, if you project this out through the end of this decade, uh, to exceed the levels of debt to GDP, debt to our, our, uh, the impact of our entire economy, those jet, the debt to GDP levels are actually, will approach by the end of this decade, a higher amount than they were at the peak of World War II. Uh, obviously, World War II, we were able to end the war, win the war, and then go back uh, to something somewhat normal after that. We don't have that on the horizon when it comes to our debt and our increasingly uh, strong deficit problems as well. If you think about that, we're at a point where the interest payments alone will eat up all that we borrow uh, each year. If you had a family member or a friend who was not only spending more each year than they took in, but they had so much debt acquired in doing that, that every dollar that they borrowed going forward was just to pay off the interest on that debt, and they were continuing to spend more than they had, we'd have an intervention. We'd sit down with that family member or that friend and sit down and say, you can't continue this. We, we gotta help you stop. We're gonna stop, uh, uh, you're gonna help stop first and foremost the spending, we're gonna get you in check, bring you back and then help you over time, not all at once, but pay back that debt. But the first thing you gotta do is stop spending more money uh, than you take in. That to me is what the federal government needs. 49 of the 50 states, every state except for Vermont, and in practice Vermont does it as well, but every state uh, other than Vermont has some form of a balanced budget requirement in our state budgets. Our local governments have to abide by a balanced budget. Certainly. Our households and our small businesses and other employers have to keep their books balanced. It's only the federal government that does it. And so what we're saying is we've got to do something about this. Uh, over the years, you know, there was a brief period of time back in the 1990s uh, when, uh, when the federal government had a balanced budget. But even then, that was largely because of the states. Uh, people like to point to the, the 1990s when Bill Clinton was uh, president of the United States and Republicans were in charge of the House and the Senate. And yeah, they did have a balanced budget for a while, um, or at least technically did. Uh, but a big part of that was because of welfare reform. There were people like John Engler from Michigan and Tommy Thompson, my friend here from Wisconsin, and others, they pushed welfare reform. And that changed the old AFDC, Aid to Families with Dependent Children system, into what we now call TANF, Temporary Aid, Need to, Feed, Temporary Aid to Needy Families. Uh, that shift created a windfall for the federal government they used to balance the budget. Of course, over time, that, that went away, and they went back to the spending ways. And this isn't necessarily a partisan thing. You, you may argue that one party's more responsible for spending levels than others. But if you look at the facts, I mean, when George Bush was president, uh, the debt went from about $5 trillion to about $10 trillion. Under Obama, it went from 10 to nearly 20 We're at 26 and a half, and, and I said, largely on a path uh, towards exceeding even World War II jet to debt to GDP levels. And so we've got to do something about that. That's why we need a balanced budget. Man. We need it now more than ever, and we need it before it's too late. Now, the easiest route to do that would be to have the route that all 27 amendments went through up until this point, 
uh, and that is to amend the Constitution through one of the two paths our founders set out. Uh, the one way that has been used in each of the 27 times it's been approved up until now was to have two thirds of the Congress vote, send it to the states, and then three quarters of the states had to vote to ratify before that change was made to the U.S. Constitution. Uh, when it comes to the balanced budget amendment, when President Reagan pushed in the 80s, he had a Republican Senate and it got through early in those uh, first few years, but it didn't pass the House. Then when Newt Gingrich became the speaker and they had included the idea of a balanced budget amendment in their contract with America, it got through the House of Representatives, but not through the Senate. What we see is the politicians in Washington are incapable, regardless of party, of ultimately getting the job done when it comes to a balanced budget amendment or even a, a balanced budget. And so thankfully our founders presented another way for, for us to do this, and that is through the states. In Article 5, uh, it says that if two thirds of the states apply for a convention, that means passing resolutions. Right now, we're up to 28 of the 34 states needed. That's something many of you know I've been working on over this past year with a number of others, including many of you on this uh, Zoom conference. If we could get to 34 states, that's one of the methods other than uh, the original method of two thirds of the state, uh, two thirds of the Congress. But if two thirds of the states and before coronavirus, we were hopeful that the next state on that list was going to be South Carolina. And then there were prospects in Idaho, and Montana, and Kentucky, and Minnesota, and Virginia, other states across the nation. If two thirds asked for a convention, passing a resolution, which serves as an application for a convention, conventions held, all 50 states have a vote, one vote at that convention. And then that language is forwarded back to the states, where again, three quarters, the ultimate check and balance three quarters would have to vote to ratify before it became a part of the Constitution. In a moment, David's gonna talk a little bit about another method of taking the 28 existing states that have already passed balanced budget specific amendments and adding to it the six that had passed over the history of our country, broad based resolutions uh, calling for conventions uh, and talking about taking legal action to force that as well as laying out a path uh, towards uh, how we can get candidates for both Congress and for the state legislative bodies uh, to commit to being supportive of the means necessary to go forward the balanced budget. Uh, and then Senate Majority Leader Hoffman from Ohio is gonna talk a little bit about his plans, his ideas about how to bring leaders together to talk about how we could go forward with this process. So my hope is uh, I'm not wed to one idea or the other, the easiest, the quickest, uh, the most efficient way to do that would be through the Congress initiating it on a two thirds vote and then the states ratifying through three quarters. But we've seen time and time again, uh, our colleagues, our friends in Washington have let us down, uh, even sometimes regardless of party. And so now more than ever, it is up to the states. It's not just the possibility, I would argue it's our responsibility, particularly in the state legislative bodies. As much as I enjoyed being a governor, the founders clearly set this out, not for governors, but for members of the state legislature to act uh, to begin the process of in initiating a change to the U.S. Constitution. Uh, my hope is that not only will you join us on this call in figuring out one or all these methods, be supportive of all the different ideas. Uh, we just got to get a balanced budget amendment passed. And with that, David, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, thanks uh, for you can bring up our PowerPoint. Uh, the key thing uh, that you said uh, that resonates with a lot of people uh, and that is got to do something. Um, and that is almost the exactly same language. In fact, it is word for word what Harry Reid said last year on C-SPAN. Um, and that is that um, we are driving ourselves into bankruptcy. We've got to do something. Now, how's that word for word? Is that not, not a bipartisan <laughs> sentiment? Uh, so uh, Ronald Reagan also made basically the same thing, but this was back uh, many years ago, and that is unless the states act quickly, the people running Congress will bankrupt America. Um, we have, as, as Scott has pointed out, the, the, they're, they're on a tear with, uh, with regard to deficit spending uh, that is unsustainable. Everybody understands that. So next slide, please. So the, the, the remedy for a, a federal government that's going off in the wrong direction is, is in Article 5. 
uh, Federalist 85, Hamilton stated that Congress shall uh, call a convention, nothing in this particular is left to the discretion of that body. In other words, this is, this is a simple math uh, 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 process, count the applications and call it whenever nine states or two thirds, which today is 34 concur, Congress shall have, will have no option on the subject. So uh, next slide, please. So there are 28 balanced budget amendment, single subject applications uh, that have not been rescinded. Four states in the last two or three years have rescinded their applications. This doesn't count any of those. So there are 28 Article 5 DBA applications that stand. And uh, according to Rob Nadelson, who is uh, the ALEC uh, scholar on Article 5 and has written uh, the, the Article 5 handbook and uh, uh, has been the author, for example, of, uh, of the ALEC model uh, balanced budget amendment application policy, so forth. So his, his publication in the, the Federalist Society concluded that be the language of six uh, any subject applications, which he calls plenary applications. If you read the, the language, you will see that it should aggregate with the 28, giving us 34 uh, Article 5 or any sub, any, any, 35 Article 5 applications uh, that should trigger the call by Congress for calling a convention. So why haven't they called a convention? <coughs> Next slide, please. They don't want to. Congress has absolutely no interest in giving the states equal authority to propose amendments as envisioned by the founders, none. Um, just to give you one example, the Congressional Research uh, Service in 2017 said, state applications have not been collected and are scattered. In other words, all of these applications which are painfully difficult to get you know legislation passed in this many states in both houses as, as matt knows it was uh, it was very tough going and um and that's that's true across the country but when they get to congress it means absolutely nothing to them they do not store them by subject they don't store them in one late location they basically have been scattered throughout uh, the halls of congress and in fact, there was a proposed uh, Article 5 Records Transparency Act, which concluded that it would take five years and $10 million simply to find those original applications going back to uh, the start of our country. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the, this is really disturbing to me. A US Senate Budget Committee chairman, who I have great respect for, stated and this is privately, and I don't have any record of this, but stated that Congress isn't going to allow the states to di dictate budgeting rules. So what are we going to do? Uh, they're, they're not, Congress is not going to call a convention. They've never counted a single Article 5 application in history, and there have been over 700 submitted by the states. So what are, you, what are we going to do? Next slide, please. We are talking to attorney generals to file a mandamus action against Congress. And uh, next slide, please. And uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, here we go. What is a mandamus? It's a judicial writ issued as a command ordering a person or persons to perform a constitutional duty. I'm not an attorney, but it is very clear to me that a mandamus is, 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 uh, is an open and shut case based on the facts uh, at hand. Congress has never countered a single application. That's their constitutional duty. And in fact, they should be calling the convention today. Uh, what would this mandamus suit do? Uh, first of all, we would have this, hopefully have this as a multi-state uh, attorney generals uh, on board with especially the 34 states, but there would be no limit. The 34 state attorney generals um, could number one, present their state's application that is being ignored by Congress today. 
It would expose Congress for unconstitutionally denying the states their right to draft and the people to ratify a U.S. balanced budget amendment. It would educate Americans on how we, the people, established the Constitution. If you read the Constitution, it was, it, it was, that's a quote, we, the people, established this Constitution. And it was by voting for uh, delegates to state conventions, probably on the basis of uh, whether they're a Federalist or Anti-Federalist, and that is, that is the process by which our Constitution was ratified. Uh, next slide, please. So you, there's a couple of things that you need to know about uh, in our history. And the first one is the ratification of the 21st Amendment. So next, uh, next slide, please. Salt Lake Tribune, December 6th of 1933. This is a quote from the newspaper. Salt Lake Tribune was basically controlled by the Mormon uh, church. Utah voters said no to the LDS, the Latter-day Saints president, Grant, and yes to repeal. The vote wasn't even close, 102,000 to 65,000 against. On December the 5th, 1933, the Utah legislature convened a constitutional convention to ratify officially the 21st Amendment. Ratification by a state convention requires a majority vote of people in 34 states for yes pledged state delegates. That is the upshot shot of, of how we ratified the repeal of prohibition. Uh, remember one thing, <laughs> Utah, uh, Mormon, you know, population is adamantly opposed to alcohol, but yet when they went to vote in secret, they voted for repeal of prohibition. If this had been left to uh, uh, the legislature, uh, the chances are very, uh, very poor that, the, that this amendment would have been ratified. So um, what, what is the other thing that we recommend? And, and, uh, and I, think, I think Matt's gonna get into this as well. And that is we believe that the states need to organize uh, the next step. Uh, in addition to the state attorney generals uh, filing the lawsuit, we think the states need to step up to organizing um, the next way to actually start drafting the balanced budget amendment. Uh, even though it, it's until, until the courts or Congress calls it an Article 5 convention, they can't self-call an Article 5 convention, not, not according to the Constitution anyway. So uh, our, our view is that, that um, one state should pass one resolution that says here are 34 Article 5 applications, 28 on a single subject, and six on any subject, uh, and we're going to call, uh, we're going to demand Congress call the convention, Article 5 convention, you've got 30 days. If you don't call the con convention, in which they very, very likely will not, <laughs> um, if they don't call the convention, then my suggestion is that we actually uh, set up a virtual uh, uh, conference of the states, one state, one vote, to actually draft a balanced budget amendment to the United States Constitution. And it was interesting um, comment from uh, the task force on Friday that why don't we have uh, a straw vote of the people for a balanced budget amendment all on one day? Well, that's really an interesting idea because worst case scenario, we don't get an Article 5 convention call uh, from anybody. Uh, despite the merits, uh, but we uh, we actually go and draft a balanced budget amendment and uh, put it on a straw vote in the next general election ballot. Uh, I think that's a great idea. So this is these are the the ideas that we want to get from you people. We want we want to do something. We've got to do something. Let's see if all of us on this call can't come up with that something. And uh, uh, with that. Um, um, uh, over to, to Matt. Well, thanks very Great. much. We'll turn it over. There you go. To uh, Senate Majority Leader uh, Matt Hoffman from Ohio. Thanks for joining us. So, thanks very much, Governor and, and David. It's um, um, I, I usually you uh, you you close with your strongest speaker, and uh, but uh, we, we might be doing this in opposite order because I, I do not rank as high as the governor. Uh, or uh, in relation to his, uh, I think, knowledge on the subject. I, 
a couple of things that I think I wanted to um, uh, add to what both David and the governor said. Um, you know, the, the, the force of this uh, concept of an Article 5 convention called by the states um, has been used before. Um, if you, some of you may recall that uh, the uh, income tax was first passed by the Congress, U.S. Congress in the late 1880s, the U.S. Supreme Court said unconstitutional. The states during the progressive era in the early 1900s began asking for a federal income tax and they passed resolutions for federal income tax for a convention. Um, and when they got uh, sort of to a critical mass, Congress said, you know, we were gonna do that the whole time anyway, we'll pass the resolution. And that's how we got the 16th Amendment. Now, by the way, the, the uh, talking points on that were that income tax would never be higher than 1% and only would tax 1% of the population. So um, this is what happens when you let the federal government draft something instead of the states. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, Ronald Reagan was a big proponent of this. They got to 32 states on a balanced budget amendment and that resulted in the Graham-Rudman Act of the uh, mid to late 1980s which I would argue was a bigger driver in balancing the federal budget than any of the folks who happen to be there. Um, with all due respect to the former governor Kasich, who was then a budget chairman in, in the mid 1990s. So Congress knows about this. Uh, I'm not shocked at all that uh, of the quote that, that David put up from, uh, you, you could probably assign that to about two thirds of the people in Congress right now, where we're not gonna let the states decide how it is we spend money which really sort of brings this whole thing to a head. Um, sometimes, you know, I think about this, this concept and it, it, it's almost like maybe a Lord of the Rings movie where some ancient giant uh, beast or, or some sort of secret or something is unlocked and suddenly it, it's the greatest power that, uh, you know, but nobody knew about it or, or it was lost for, for all time. And, and, and the, the, the basic concept here is, is that the states make the rules for the federal government. That's what our, our constitutional uh, basis is. And we needed to have a strong uh, federal government for a lot of reasons, mostly defense, uh, but also to regulate interstate commerce and protect the rights of, of individuals that uh, were uh, not protected by the individual states, all of those things. But in fact, the 50 states are in effect, a board of directors um, that uh, dictate policy or should dictate policy to the elected federal officers, the president and the treasurer and, and the secretaries, et cetera, just like in a, in a corporation, it's the same concept. And um, we know that Congress, of course, has done this before, but like most people, uh, they're not going to say, I'm going to give my power to somebody else because I wanna be able to do that. That's just not going to happen. So uh, as mentioned, the founders knew that and that's why we have this alternate uh, method. Now, one of the principal problems with uh, having an Article 5 convention is uh, the same problem that any Speaker of the House or President of the Senate and certainly Governor Walker would have experienced this is even in states where everybody's, even in places where everybody's coming to the same place to work every day, it's hard to get everybody on the same page. Sometimes it's hard to get everybody to show up uh, or to take a real interest in, and I'm talking about in state legislatures for those, those who have served in that, probably most of the people on this call. Um, and uh, so think about that when you're trying to coordinate among 50 disparate legislatures who, uh, despite the efforts of ALEC and other organizations, really rarely see each other, don't know each other very well. And in the age of uh, term limits, it's even worse. It's even more difficult to really get to know folks and, and, and all of that. So, you know, for my own part, I, I sponsored the balanced budget amendment um, when we passed it and, and Governor Kasich was instrumental in getting that passed uh, here in Ohio. One of the other things I did was work with uh, a, a group of, of legislators um, around the country trying to draft rules for an Article 5 convention. At one point, we had about 35 states participating in that, and, and we did pass rules. Um, uh, the great Tom Coburn in a dinner here in Ohio once said, 
you know, they can just draft rules when they start the convention. And I said, I understand that. No, nobody has to do anything until a convention is called. But all of these efforts, um, as, as I've heard some folks say, they're all part of the movement uh, for an Article 5 convention to happen. Um, the, and I will have to say um, that often Article 5 convention seekers work at odds with each other because people think, well, that's not exactly my idea, so I'm going to try to make sure that idea doesn't happen. And so there is a lot of uh, infighting and, and backbiting and uh, submarining that happens in this movement. And, and I think that's unfortunate. I don't think there's any way to stop it because a lot of people sort of want their idea to go forward. And if they're talking about other ideas, um, they don't want to hear about that. Or, and so that, that is, has been a problem, I think, in the Article 5 movement in the way that I've been involved for about 15 years. There are many state legislatures today that don't want a balanced budget at the federal government because of the money they get. They need the money from the federal government to balance their budgets and to pay. And they aren't looking at the long-term effects that when the federal government, not if, but when the federal government can't pay anymore, it is going to be the states that are most reliant on federal money and the population, the people who most rely on that, who are going to suffer the most. But like most legislators uh, and other public officials, they think about today and not tomorrow. So, um, but I will tell you that there are many things that most legislators agree on. Um, you know, and, and if, if we don't all agree on a balanced budget amendment uh, and we don't all agree on uh, term limits for federal judges or on repealing Citizens United, we can all fight about that. If we put the question and said, state legislators, how many of you would vote to allow the president of the United States to have a line item veto? Well, uh, I think, and I'm sure Governor Walker knows better than me, I think 49 of the 50 governors, and maybe Vermont's the exception, have the line item veto in, in the United States, of, of the states. Um, and the lining and veto doesn't necessarily um, help the Democrats or the Republicans. Remember, uh, by the way, Congress passed the line item veto. The U.S. Supreme Court said that's unconstitutional. So we, we, the states, can overrule the U.S. Supreme Court. It's been done before. Um, we've, there, there have been a variety of times when constitutional amendments uh, were passed. Uh, that overruled a decision of the Supreme Court. Uh, the age of voting, there was a Supreme Court decision that said, now nah, states can say it's 21 and states be passed a constitutional amendment said, now it's 18. Whether you agree with the wisdom of that or not, it was the states reacting to a U.S. Supreme Court decision by Congress passing an amendment and then the states approving that. So, um, I do have a couple of ideas I've, I've discussed with, with Governor and, and uh, Walker and with David. Um, and I think what we really need to do prim preliminarily is, is to gather the states, uh, not in a convention, um, and we use these terms loosely, by the way, when we say an Article 5 convention, and then we say convention of the states. And someone said to me the other day, well, these aren't Article 5 conventions, these are conventions of the states. And I but while every ALEC meeting is a convention of the states, the NFL is showing up, or many of the states are. So there, there, there have been many conventions of states. We talk about Maryland, we talk about um, the, the uh, Water Rights Convention back in the early 1900s, the recent uh, event out in, in uh, Arizona a couple of years ago. None of those are Article Five conventions. They are states coming together and talking about convention uh, in one manner or another. I don't really like the fact that we sort of talk about those things as though sometimes they're the same. It's, it's, it's confusing on a confusing topic to many legislators who don't know that much about this because let's face it, they've got other issues to deal with. Um, I think that we need to have a, I'm gonna use some other different word than convention, convocation, meeting, assembly, uh, get together, powwow, sit down, whatever it is that everybody wants to use to um, uh, vet out any idea that anyone has. Now, for those of you yelling runaway convention into their 
uh, computers. First of all, it's not a convention. And second of all, um, this isn't a binding vote. What I really think that we need to do is sit down and see what are the viable uh, convention or, or, or viable amendments that can pass at a convention. And I think there, there are probably some that, that uh, the Magic 34 and or 40 states or, or more would agree on. I mentioned the line item veto. Um, would someone vote no on saying you can't take money out of social security trust funds to pay for ongoing operations? Um, as the trustee of my employee's 401k plan, I would get arrested for doing that, by the way, and federal <laughs> government's uh, sort of standard operating procedure. Um, so there are other things. So I'm gonna be working on that. Um, and of course, many of you, I hope, will, will try to participate in that. I think it needs to be driven by the leaders of the bodies. Um, the assembly of state legislators, the, the effort I had on drafting rules before, there were some leaders in there, most notably uh, Robin Voss, David Long. Uh, those are well-known names, I think. Um, but not everybody there was. And uh, I, I think until we have, um, I guess my hope is, in theory, 99 state legislative leaders all sitting in a room saying, yes or no to proposed resolutions, including a balanced budget resolution, I don't think we move the ball down the field. Now, I would love to see a lawsuit filed and a lawsuit prevail on having the convention on the balanced budget amendment. Um, that's a huge step forward. Um, uh, and if that can happen, um, you know, I'll be uh, passing resolutions in support of that if I can in the Ohio Senate. And, um, but, you know, it's my intention to try to, to move this ball forward on a broad base and, and begin to um, uh, accumulate um, a, opinion of state legislators on not just a balanced budget amendment, but on a variety of other topics that I think are, are, can be successful. So I hope I didn't overstep my time there. Usually no, that was great. Me on the shoulder, so. Yeah, that was great, Leader Hoffman. Uh, and in fact, initially when you <clears throat> to me alluded to uh, Grand Runman Hollings, that's a great example, a great reminder of, and I've talked to Phil Graham about this recently, of a really well-intentioned uh, process that worked for a while. And then eventually uh, another Congress came in and just like state legislative bodies, you can't, uh, a future body, unless it's in the constitution, can always change something. And that's what happened with Grand Room and Hollings. That's what happened years after uh, the uh, welfare reform in the 90s that helped balance the budget. That's what happened even after sequestration, all which were various forms of trying to get the federal uh, debt and deficit issues under control, which is ultimately why, <clears throat> excuse my cough, which is ultimately why there has to be some sort of a, an amendment. And I think your point uh, is that ultimately we've got to look at, at ways to move this process forward. David, you alluded to the fact that last week at the, uh, at the Federalism Task Force, when this issue was brought up, uh, one of the lawmakers, one of the participants suggested the idea you referenced of uh, maybe even having non-binding advisory referendum questions on ballots all across the country to try and further add uh, public support, which might encourage uh, legislative leaders to do what Matt's talking about and say, yeah, this is an issue we want to identify to move, to move forward on. Uh, the reason why I'm on this session and, and why I've been talking about it is I just see the problem as pressing. I know uh, Leader Hoffman, you do, and many of the others on, on this Zoom conference do. We just got to figure out a way to do it. I don't have uh, pride of authorship or, or a specific plan that has to happen. I just know we've got to get to a balanced budget. The last thing I'll, I'll uh, just end with, and then I think if it's all right with the Alec folks, if there's folks that got questions, uh, we're open to take them. Uh, for the reigning time that we've got left. Uh, but President Reagan, uh, one of my favorite quotes of his is one that's often not referenced, uh, but should be, and he said it in his first inaugural address in January of 1981, that midway through, he said, we should all remember the federal government did not create the states, the states created the federal government. And that's yet another reminder of why the states have it within their power uh, to transform the federal government and, and really more than just transforming the government, uh, reestablish uh, the future for our children and our, 
our children's children when it comes to debt and deficit issues. So uh, with that, um, I, I'll refer back to the Alex staff to tell us if we've got anybody with questions. Yeah, we have a few questions. The first one is from Senator Kevin Lundberg of Colorado. He writes, as the co-chair of the State Legislators Article 5 Caucus, uh, you can visit them at articlevcaucus.com. I can assure everyone, many of us have been working hard on this issue since 2012. We send out our monthly uh, newsletter to all state legislators across the country. What are the next specific steps you suggest we take to make a convention reality? Well, I, I think from what we just, uh, part of what we talked about here is there's a couple different options. Um, certainly the process that was moving forward uh, that I was personally involved with before kind of the shutdown uh, closed not just the nation's economy, but most of our legislative bodies immediately or, or fairly immediately uh, shut down. So part of it is encouraging uh, states that have yet to pass a balanced budget amendment resolution that would serve as an application. States like South Carolina, Idaho, Montana, Kentucky, Minnesota, uh, Virginia, all of those, if you're from those states or if you've got friends, colleagues, uh, family, uh, fellow lawmakers that you know from those states, that would be incredibly helpful. Second, per what David was talking about, uh, in addition to that, I think per his idea of pursuing this Mandeep, Mandibus, uh, action where you have the 28 states that have already passed resolutions plus uh, the six from the past that were open-ended, that weren't specific to a balanced budget, but rather called for an open, or not an open, but called for just a convention in general. Um, that's another route to take to say, to do that, though you can't probably just do that with a, a private citizen taking legal action. Really, uh, to pursue David's idea would need uh, an, at least a attorney general uh, and a legislature, if not multiple ones, joining in a suit to make the argument that that 34 state threshold has been met. And then the other thing, none of which are an either or, they could all happen uh, at, at a parallel time, uh, what uh, Leader Hoffman was talking about, and that is getting legislative leaders together to talk about uh, not only the balanced budget, but are there any other issues of which there's some common ground uh, where there's support. And you probably need to have, as he talked about numbers, more than just the 34 to initiate. <clears throat> it probably isn't worth pushing things that aren't going to get to at least the 38 threshold. <clears throat> you need to have 38 states. Uh, three quarters of the states have to vote to ratify. So it, it, I always say that's the ultimate safeguard against some of these crazy ideas out there, uh, 38 states. The one last thing for the question, uh, is something that we referenced from last week, and that is, I, I don't think there's, <clears throat> excuse my cough, I don't think there's any harm in uh, states pursuing a balanced budget amendment, particularly if you have the ability to have advisory, non-binding uh, referendum questions on the ballot uh, to put that out there, because I got to believe, as we've seen in polling, not just Republicans, not just independents, but Democrat voters overwhelmingly support a balanced budget amendment for the federal government and that uh, to put that on the ballot might be one more thing that helps uh, in these various process points going forward. Um, I, I, I wanted to I kind of put a little meat on the bone with, with, with my thought about why we have to have more robust state legislative involvement in this process. Um, we, you know, we have term limits, you know, there, there are people who act with an ALEC or NCSL and these other organizations and legislative leaders sort of come and go. So it, it's really difficult, but you know, why is that important? Um, yeah, we pass a resolution and then nothing happens because Congress goes, well, they're not making us do anything. Well, what if in a, you know, uh, suddenly in a, in a state that was, you know, a speaker or a president of the Senate who otherwise doesn't know anything about this is informed about what this process is and realizes the importance of it. And we can get their attention. That speaker, that president of the Senate starts going to their congressional delegation and saying, why are we being ignored? Mm. Why aren't you doing what you said you were supposed to? Because I don't think that's happening right now. Um, you know, I've had conversations through the years with various folks in the congressional delegation and you know a lot of it is I don't know if the speaker wants to do that right. I don't, it, it, but there is no public pressure 
the fresh and, and, and part of it is because the, this is a pretty esoteric topic. The public doesn't really know about it. And we can put out resolutions and, and most people say, yeah, we want a balanced budget. And that's what most polls would say. But the public doesn't understand this process. Um, we need to bring public attention to this. We need to bring public political power to this um, by challenging our congressional delegations in every state. You know, we're the, the, the state congressional delegation is, is supposed to be controlled by the state legislature. That's why we can draw districts to determine the time, place, and manner. Uh, we used to have more control over the Senate until the 17th Amendment was passed. When we, state legislatures, pick the senators. Um, and now it's frank, frankly largely chosen by whoever can fund them nationally in our individual states and can come in and pay for the you know, U.S. Senate's campaign. So, um, you know, there really needs to be a, and we had a pretty pretty good group. I mentioned Robin Voss, a great speaker from Wisconsin, not just saying that because Governor Walker is really a great speaker. Uh, David Long, formerly in, in Indiana, very, very strong uh, voice for this, Wayne Niederhauser in Utah and, and others. And um, we also need to be able to have a table big enough that there are ideas that come to this event or meeting or discussion, however it is, that are ideas that I don't like. But let's take a vote. Um, you know, we have, we have lots of folks uh, still, the Eagle Forum, the John Birch Society, well, if we have this, we're gonna repeal the Second Amendment. And when I asked them, how many state, states do you think would ratify, vote to ratify that kind of amendment? Do you really think there are 38 states? Because I can name 38 states that wouldn't do that. Um, and so we really need to have these in open discussion. And it's messy and ugly, but probably not any worse than the original constitutional uh, convention when, when our constitution was drafted. So. There, there needs to be public tumult about this. There needs to be, and, and not just sort of this academic discussion about what it means and things like that. Um, because we are, there is a coming collapse in the federal government. Um, you know, we're getting near the end of all the trust funds, the hundred or so federal trust funds that have been borrowed. Um, so I, I think that's what has to happen. I would love for the U.S. Supreme Court to order the Congress to do it. Um, that's the quickest, less messy way. Uh, it's hard to believe litigation is less messy than uh, <laughs> democracy, but in this case, it is. I've got one more question. Um, so given the COVID-19 pandemic and the national emergency around that, how would a balanced budget amendment work during uh, another national emergency just like this pandemic, uh, especially as it relates to something like a federal bailout of states? Sure, I can jump in. I know in discussions in the past, and again, this would all be language that would have to be hammered out uh, precisely by the states in a convention, if you got to that point through any of the methods we just talked about, <clears throat> but many of the uh, the state lawmakers and even some of the legal experts that have been helping in the states have talked about this process. Um, again, there's no one set plan, but uh, the plan I've heard or the idea I've heard most talked about would be that there'd be, uh, you could add language that would include um, some sort of an emergency provision, but that would require a, a mega supermajority vote and uh, most specifically, in most of the instances has been talked about or ideas have been talked about, not only it would require that vote, it would have a, a limited time. So it would sunset. So say you got to, in the past, prior to COVID-19, it was what would happen if there was a world war? Um, I suppose you could apply what's happened in the last six months with COVID-19. But the idea of it would require uh, a mega supermajority vote of the Congress there'd be a time limit, so it would sunset. So whether it's three months, six months, again, that would have to be determined in the language at the, at the Article 5 convention. But hypothetically, say you had a, a, a vote, so you had an overwhelming vote, would have to be probably across party lines if it was a mega supermajority, and then say it was for six months, six months later, it goes back to the original language uh, in the constitutional amendment. And the only way it could continue is if they came back six months later 
and uh, the country faced the same circumstances. So there clearly is a, a provision. Now, I, I would just add one more thought on that. I would say that the, the money that the federal government has spent in the last four or five months because of COVID-19 is putting us obviously escalating the problem. Had we had back when Reagan pushed for this back in the 1980s, a balanced budget amendment, we would have been in a much better position today, this year in 2020, to do what the federal government, whether you agree with all of it or not, but to do something like what they've done, uh, because we'd actually have some room uh, to be able to uh, account for that level of spending. Uh, we don't now. It's, it's and same with your, your own households or your own uh, businesses. If you've got a small business, if you're living high off at debt and a crisis comes along, it's pretty hard to handle that. If you've store, stored up some, you've saved and you've kept your budget intact, and then when something bad happens, it's a lot easier to account for that. So I would say, if, if, if anything, this makes a really compelling argument uh, as to why we need to have a balanced budget in the first place. Now, this has um, uh, been much studied by uh, economists, including uh, Alex's own uh, uh, counsel, uh, Dr. Barry Paulson, and what and uh, Jonathan Williams is also on this big time, and that is that um, the most successful fiscal restraint in the world today uh, is uh, uh, similar to um, a spending growth limit that's been established by Tabor in Colorado, and also the Swiss debt break. And the way uh, uh, national emergencies, in fact. The way that uh, national emergencies are handled on the Swiss debt break is really is really interesting. It says a simple majority vote of the people in the legislative body can authorize uh, an emergency spending above the spending growth limit. Uh, spending growth limit is something like inflation plus population. But when the when the emergency spending is done, whatever was spent on that emergency. Uh, basically has to be paid back with interest by reducing the future growth uh, spending uh, uh, amount uh, to pay back uh, the special spending you know, uh, amount plus interest. And that could be over 10 years, it could be over 30 years. Obviously, for something like this pandemic, uh, you would have to slow the growth of government spending down by enough to pay back over 30 or 40, maybe even 50 years, get a 50 year sinking bond. Um, so uh, our, our actual pledge uh, that campaign that we're running, at, that at a minimum, a balanced budget amendment to the United States Constitution would limit the growth of spending to population plus inflation up to 2% with exceptions for social security and national emergencies. So there, there, there is a way through this that actually you know, 75 years from now means that the federal government is basically going to grow slower in spending than what the paychecks of the American households would. And that is a prescription for uh, prosperity for the American people. And we have another question from a former speaker of the Iowa House of Representatives, Linda Upmeyer. Uh, she is wondering, is this a time for all the legislative organizations to come together to get this uh, Article 5 amendment done? And is there a dialogue for that uh, ongoing? Um, I, I, I'll take a shot at that. Uh, nice, to, nice to hear from you uh, again, Linda. Uh, appreciate all the work that you've done on this um, process, as, as well as Kevin, uh, who's done a good job through the years, especially on this uh, our Article 5 caucus. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think the answer is um, there is. I am, you know, appreciating that uh, Alec and NCSL and CSG and other various uh, organizations, there's leadership organizations for uh, speakers and presidents and majority leaders, uh, and then a variety of other, I guess, sub organizations that deal with specific topics. This should be one thing that everybody has an opinion about. They may not agree on the method and the way and, and particularly the subject matter, but the fundamental question is, should the states control policy 
of the federal government? And if your answer to that question is not yes, you should read the Constitution and read the Federalist Papers. It's not just, in my opinion, a good idea or something that's long in coming or something that has to happen because the federal government budget will crash and burn. This is the responsibility of the states to act. And not just, in my opinion, from time to time when there's a crisis, which is kind of what this has worked. Um, there should be a convention periodically of the states to propose amendments to the Constitution. We have it in the state of Ohio. Every 20 years, there's supposed to be a convention unless the General Assembly decides to take another method, which we did. I sat on a, a body. I was appointed to that by Speaker Batchelder. And many other states have a recurring constitutional convention where amendments are proposed. And I think that ought to be, in the future, what happens. Now, again, I know a lot of my friends on the right are pulling their hair out as I say that. And you know, they're trying to remind me of something that happened with the um, Confederation of States and, and, and all those sorts of things. But we are in charge, we, and I say that collectively as a member of a state legislature, 7,000 state legislators in, in, in the US, we are responsible for the conduct of the federal government. And if we obviate that responsibility, if we say, nah, it's too hard, or you know, I'm more worried about something that's going on in my state, um, we are not upholding our oath of office. So NCSL should be pushing for this, trying to get it done. ALEC should be trying to get it done, CSG. Now remember, there are a lot of folks within those organizations who the first thing they're gonna do is call up their congressman or senator and say, do you want this? And the congressman says, no, oh, we don't want that. And they're like, wow, we don't want that. Well, you're calling the wrong person. You should be asking yourself or your colleague. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I, I think it's critical that these, you know, I know there's different reasons why these organizations exist, but a, 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 it, in the end, rising above a conclave of these legislative organizations has to be the legislative leaders in each house. Um, I would love to see if, if I was a legislative leader next, perhaps I, w I will be next year in the Ohio Senate. Um, I would love for the Democratic Speaker of the House or President of the Senate and other states come to a meeting and tell me how wrong I am about everything because then I'd be meeting with them about it. We'd be talking about it. And I think that's what that, and I, and I think all of these organizations can help facilitate it, fund it, plan it, get it done with their, with their various uh, assets that they have. Great. One quick thing to highlight and then uh... Um, I, I know we're near the end of the hour. Appreciate the time everybody's given to us. Uh, Leader Hoffman, I thought one thing you said uh, in particular jumped out the phrase, you said uh, uh, responsibility. I, I think it's really important on this issue for lawmakers to remember it's not just the possibility uh, to change the Constitution, it's the responsibility. And that's really what I think if you look closely at Article 5, you're exactly right, uh, Senator, that the uh, that the founders gave legislative bodies at the state level uh, the, the responsibility, not just the possibility to do this, the responsibility, uh, understanding that even at the time of the founding of our country and the, or the approval of that, uh, of our first, uh, or the approval of the Constitution, I should say, not just our first, the Constitution, which has been amended since, uh, they knew uh, that the power of the states uh, was uh, paramount and they gave us these tools for the state, not just states, but particularly state legislators to have this responsibility. So I appreciate everybody uh, joining us here today and, and uh, thinking about the next steps going forward. Particularly appreciate uh, Leader Hoffman, your leadership on this and David, your passion for it as well. Yeah, I, I, I wanna thank Alec and, and uh, Governor Walker. I, I don't think we can have a better national leader and spokesman than, than Governor Walker on this. And uh, I think David and I have been talking about this for uh, 15 years. He never changes, you always look the same. You're always standing in front of a palm tree whenever I see you, so fantastic. I, I, have, a, I have a request of, um, of our Senate Majority Leader from Ohio, and that is, why don't we just have a 
invite people that you've already named, uh, the Linda Upmeyers and the Wayne Niederhausers and the speaker boss, why don't we just have like a virtual get together just to kick around just what you're talking about. How can we pull this together? And if you could pull in somebody from the Assembly of State Legislatures on the other side, that would be uh, incredible. And we're just talking about sharing ideas. How can we move this ball forward? Uh, I'd love, th that would be my one request, is that we get a leadership, four, five, six states. It doesn't have to be, you know, 40 states for sure, but get a leadership, you know, uh, uh, meeting off the ground of a summit of, of uh, states that want to make this happen. So that's that's my request. Yeah, I, I'm working on it. Um, and I, I think we need to begin to invite legislative leaders who don't agree with us. Yeah, I agree. Have this discussion and not just the folks who I agree. You know, can all high five each other and then go about our business. Yeah, no, and I, I do want you to know that I'm having an important meeting on this topic tomorrow afternoon with David Long. Uh, at the Sycamore Hills Golf Course in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And we'll be discussing this for four hours <laughs> and trying to win his member guest, so. Yeah, David Long is a hero. He is, he, he, he is. invented the Delegate Limitation Act and they've got to 14 states and it's been considered by uh, about half of the states already. And it's, a, it's an important law. He, he initiated this, so uh, he's, uh, he's truly a leader on this.